Uh, greetings, Twihards. Well, it's now time to take, well, it's time to take a look at the final film of the Twilight series, Breaking Dawn, Part 2. Bella, who was just given birth, awakens from her human to vampire transformation and is introduced to her daughter, Renesme. <clears throat> the rest of the cult and Jacob stay nearby, and when Jacob acts possessively towards Renesme, Bella learns he has imprinted on her making her furious until Jacob explains what imprinting is. Meanwhile, Bella's father, Charlie, has been trying to contact the Collins for updates on Bella's health. Carla comes to believe that they have to leave Forks, Washington to protect their identities, especially because of Charlie. Jacob, desperate not to lose Renesme, visits Charlie and tells him that Bella is alive and well, but has to change in order to get better. Jacob also tells Charlie he doesn't live in the world he thinks he lives in, but says nothing about vampires. He then reveals his wolf form to Charlie. Charlie then visits the Cullen house and meets Renesmee. Afterward, the Cullens are able to stay in Forks. Several months pass with Carlisle monitoring Renesmee's rapid growth. On an outing in the woods, the bitter Irina sees Renesmee from a distance and assumes she's an immortal child without asking any questions. The immortal children are vampires who were changed in childhood because they could not be trained or restrained, they destroyed entire villages. They were eventually executed, as were the parents who created them, and the creation of such children outlawed. Irina goes to the Volturi to report what she has seen. Alice sees the Volturi and Irina coming to kill the Collins, and instructs the others to gather as many witnesses as they can to testify that Renesme is not an immortal child. Alice and Jasper then leave to try and gather evidence of this. <clears throat> The Collins begin to summon witnesses, such as the Denali family. One of the Denali, Eleazar, later discovers that Bella has a special ability, a powerful mental shield that had protected her from Edward's mind reading even when she was human, and which she is taught to extend to protect others, others from vampire powers. As some of their potential witnesses are attacked and prevented from supporting the Collins, Carl and Edward realize they may have to fight the Volturi. Their witnesses ultimately agree to stand with them in battle, but in reality, the Volturi increased their guard by falsely accusing covens of crimes, destroying them, and then recruiting the vampires with gifts. Volturi arrived prepared for battle, led by Aro, who was eager to obtain the gifted members of the Cullen Coven as part of his guard. Aro was allowed to touch her Nisme and is convinced that she is not an immortal child. <clears throat> Irene is brought forth and takes full responsibility for her mistake, leading to her imminent, immediate death. Aro insists that Renesme may pose a risk in the future, validating his claim that battle is necessary. Before any violence, Alice and Jesper return, and Alice shares with Aro her provision of the battle that is to come, during which both sides sustain heavy casualties, including Aro, who would also die. Aro believes her, giving Alice and Jesper to reveal their witness, Nahuyel, a half-human, half-vampire, just like Renesme. The witness proves that he is not a threat, supporting the notion that Renesme is not a threat. The Volturian happily leave, explaining that there will be no battle today. Back at the Cullen home, Alice glimpses the future, seeing Edward and Bella together with Jacob and a fully matured Renesme also together. Edward reads Alice's mind and feels relieved that Renesme has Jacob to protect her. Alone in the meadow, Bella pushes her mental shield away and finally allows Edward to see into her mind showing him every moment she and Edward had shared together, and the two share a kiss after Bella telling Edward, nobody has, loved, nobody has ever loved anybody as much as I love you, and both Edward and Bella say they will love each other and be together forever. Aww. So anyway, let's take a look at the production of this movie beginning with the development. In May 2010, Billy Burke and Peter Faccinelli were the only cast actors who were confirmed for both parts of Breaking Dawn. While other cast members, such as Ashley Green and Kellen Lutz, were still in negotiations for a second part. With the actors holding Summit back from making an official announcement did not reach an agreement with them, the studio would not have minded recasting their roles, as was done in the Twilight Saga Eclipse with Bryce Dallas Howard's character, Victoria. However, in June 2010, Summit officially confirmed that a two part adaptation of the fourth book would start production, and it made clear that all major actors, including the, th the three lead roles, the Cullen family, and Charlie Swan would return for both parts. 
Now onto pre-production. Oh, excuse me. By August 2009, Rosenberg said that the scripts for parts 1 and 2 were 75-85% to 85 completed. She found the greatest challenge in writing the scripts to be the final sequence of part 2. Quote, The final battle sequence is just a big challenge for his last 25 pages, she said. It's almost the entire three-act story in and of itself. I have to keep track, keep, all in, keep it all in setting, hundreds of characters. It's an enormous challenge to choreograph on the page and for Bill Content to choreograph on the stage. She had written various drafts of the scene, but at that, had her advice or discussed with Condon yet. She said, quote, That's the next big hurdle to sit down with the stunt coordinator and create the ballet. It's a lot of work. I'm exhausted. We're intent on making them the best scripts yet. Godfrey called part two, quote, an action film in terms of life and death stakes. It said that in part one, quote, there are the pangs of newly tension that occur that are relatable even in a fantasy film. Or just not quite the experience that they thought it was. Condon thought of part one as, quote, a real companion piece to Catherine Hardwick's movie. Condon explains, quote, like, everything that got set up there gets resolved here. I think you'll find that they are stylistic and other nods to that film. Godfrey considered releasing a second film in 3D to differentiate between the time before and after Bella becomes a vampire, an idea originally proposed for Eclipse, but said that the decision is up to Condon. However, he said if the second film were, be, were to be released in 3D, he'd like to shoot it with a proper 3D, well, shoot proper equipment in real 3D as was done with Avatar, not convert it into 3D in post-production as done with Clash of the Titans. Excuse me. On February 12, 2012, it was confirmed that Part 2 would not be filmed in 3D. And now on to the filming. Filming started on November 1, 2010 and wrapped for most of the cast on April 15, 2011, ending the franchise's three years of production since March 2008. Filming was shot on location in Baton Rouge and New Orleans, Louisiana, Vancouver, British Columbia, and New York City, New York. Filming also occurred at Raleigh Studios in Baton Rouge. On the subject of the final day and her final moment as Bella, Stewart stated, quote, After that scene, my true final scene, I felt like I could shoot up in the night sky and pour, and every part of my body would shoot light. I felt lighter than I've ever felt in my life. On April 2012, the crew and cast, including Patterson and Stewart, returned for reshoots to pick up some additional shots for technical work with some of the cast and stunt actors. These reshoots did not include any new scenes or dialogue. And now onto the special effects. Tippa Studios first began work on the CGI wolves in February 2009 for the Twilight Saga New Moon, and the look of the creatures has evolved, becoming more photoreal over the course of the saga, with the input of the of three different directors. It's a, subtle, it's, such a, it's a subtle balance of just how anthropomorphic these wolves are, says Eric Levin. Bill Condon wanted to make sure that we had a sense of the human or the shapeshifter in there. Finding that balance of how much a, of how a, of how much of a human performance versus an animal performance was important for Bill. Levin adds, quote, Bill's always treated the wolves as characters and never as computer generated things. He directs them in the same way he'd direct any actor. He always give us direction like Sam should be angrier. It's the best way to work. He's treating these char these creatures as characters instead of computer bits was really his treating these char these creatures as characters instead of just computer bits was really great. Because we have been working on this franchise for such a prolonged period of time, we've been able to prove the look from show to show, comments Phil Tippett. Quote, wolves generally are pretty darn clean and since Bill wanted the wolves rang rangier, that means putting that means a lot more fur matting and clumping, like they live down in the woods. Wish for something a bit more feral. <clears throat> However, there is also balance between look and technology, adds to bit. Quote, the body count of the wolves escalates and because they're in a great deal more hair to gather a texture, that for really ends up that for really ups, ups the rendering time. We've gone from four to twelve we've gone from four wolves to eight to twelve to sixteen in part two. So we have to be very careful about that balance because it takes hundreds of hours to render each wolf. And now finally on to the music. It was revealed in January 2012 that the soundtrack for Part 2 had already started production. Confirmed for the soundtrack in advance were Heart of Stone by Aiko, which plays when Edward and Bella are, are talking in the cottage after finding Alice's note, and Where I Come From by Passion Pit, 
which will play when Bella wakes up from transformation. The lead single from the soundtrack is The Forgotten, performed by the American rock band Green Day. A Thousand Years Part 2 by the American singer Christina Perry is also featured on the soundtrack album. <clears throat> Carter Burwell, the composer of Twilight and Breaking Down Part 1, returned to score the final installment of the series. So overall, it's the final chapter in the Twilight Saga. This one just knocks out of the park, and yeah. So I give Twilight Saga Breaking Down Part 2 5 Vampire Fangs out of 5. Well, thank you all so much for watching these Young Adult April 2021 videos. Hope you enjoyed all these reviews. And tune in next year as we take a look at the Hunger Games series. So, until then, see you everybody.